Psalm 25, lead me in your truth, a Psalm of David. This Psalm is a little interesting because it goes through each let, it's a, it goes through each letter in the Hebrew Bible, heth, teth, yod, yod, kap, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> might be mispronouncing it, but there's a few times within scripture that there's this poetic, poetic structure where you set up a rhyme or a, a pass a praise or a prayer in alphabetical order. We see this a lot in Psalms specifically. Every once in a while you'll see it elsewhere, but Psalms is the main place in which you'll see this, which I've seen it. So Psalm 25, there's not much to talk about. Because you get to see there's little sections. Psalm 25 verse 1. To you, O Yahweh, I lifted up my soul. Verse 2, it's a different section. It just, it for us, visually, it looks like it's a different section. Even though we might be able to make it flow much more easily by removing the, um, the, al the alphabet letters, the words, Zion, he, ha, uh, he, vav. If we removed those, I think the flow would be much better, but... The way that it's structured visually, we can uh, segment and focus in on certain sections of this passage. Now, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But we get to focus on one verse at a time, which is perfect for the process in which I'm doing. And one thing to preface and to reiterate is that exegesis, I know, it's like we're going through this phrase, like, well, I already know what exegesis is. Anybody who does not know, exegesis specifically, I know this is, uh, there we go, exegesis, I know, beautiful words here, exegesis surprisingly has nothing to do with Jesus, it sounds like it, but it doesn't, it's a Greek word, exegetic, I don't know if it's exegetical or exe, exegetical, I don't know, but to exegete is to explain, and word association, something that I found to be helpful, is if we get this first part of the word, the X, the pronunciation of that word association, we will extract. Extrapolate. I don't know if this is correct. Uh, extrapolate and to explain. That's the other one. So if, oh, there you go, almost, there we go. To exegete, we need to first focus on two primary rules when it comes to grammar specifically. There's other things in which you could explain within economics, mathematics, AI, uh, physics. There's things that you can explain very easily by focusing on the very tenets and basis of that thing. What I found to be very helpful in a simple way of understanding grammar is we're going to be focusing on two things. The pronouns, that's one, and number two, the verbs. Because the pronouns, you have three. One, two, three things to focus on. Who is talking? Who is he talking to? Who is he talking about? We always get that with every single time in which we do this. And then verbs, we get one, two, three things to focus on. The past, the present, and the future. Jesus Christ died for my sins. That's a past tense. Jesus Christ secured my eternal life. I will live. So secured is a past tense verb, but the life that which I will live is in the future for eternity. So there's different things. Uh, verbs that we can understand what is being communicated to us. The pronouns is the most important part because once we understand who is being referred to, then the act in which they did that thing, do that thing, will then start to explain things more. But we need to first understand who is being referred to first. So we go with the first verse. To you, capital Y, uh, often referred to God. Before we get into the rest of the verse, we already know who is being talked about. And then, in the next two words, we get O oh, Yahweh. We understand who's being talked to. Again, this is something not for us uh, if we were trying to interpret 
the original text. This is us as um, us reading an interpreted text and trying to piece together what was being communicated to us. Because back then, they, um, not back then, the people who ha always make translations have to take the, to the totality of scripture and the individual line in the prior prior verse the prior and the future verse they have to piece things together in a much more minutia but us as english readers or whatever language it is that you're reading in your translation these words are keywords for us to look at so when we see a capital y in the word you that is referring to god because he is a pro he he is deserving of the proper pronouns, and it's a, to a distinguishment to point to him. So when we read the verse, to you, God, O Yahweh, his proper name, I lift up my soul. Who is lifting up his soul? This is a psalm of David. So David, King David, is lifting up his soul. How many of these psalms has King David written? It seems as though King David is a very important person in scripture. <laughs> it's very. Oh my God. Who's God? King David's God. In you, God, I, King David, trust. Do not let me, King David, be ashamed. Do not let my enemies, King David's enemies, exalt over me, King David. So he's praying a plea and asking God for help. Sorry about that. Hmm. I honestly have no idea why I've just been so sneeze sneezy and drainy over these last weeks. I don't know if it was just my brain or healing because of the car wreck that I got into or if I've just been overworked, or maybe it's my diet. Hopefully it's not my diet, because I thought I've been doing pretty good. Pretty good, not great, but pretty good. Okay, Gimel. Oh, sorry, there we go. Indeed, let none of his enemies, because we understand the people who are being referred to are one God, two King David, and three his enemies. So when we get to the word, let none... Well, he's talking to God, we already understand before we get into any of the other, of the rest of the verse, King David is talking about his enemies. God, I don't want them to be praised. Remove, excuse me, remove them, destroy them. This is how powerful exegesis is. When we understand who is being referred to, and if we are wrong, we change based off the new information that is accumulated, but we can extrapolate, extract, and explain what is being referred to each, or who is being referred to, and what's being referred to, every single line. By every line, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. I know what's happening. This is the power, again, of power of exegesis from what I have found. Let none of these evil people against King David who hope in you. Oh, oh no, I was wrong. Isn't that beautiful? We, or I guess me, I guess, <laughs> was interpreting none as the enemies. But the moment that I gained new information from the text, it changes who none is referring to. I was interpreting none to be the enemies. But when we gain new information, it's beautiful how this is all panning out. When we gain new information, the ones, let none who hope in you be ashamed. So who is the who are the ones that hope in Christ, hope in God? Christians, I'd say Messianic Jews, <laughs> and I, I guess those who have general revelation of God, but not actual, not the full revelation of God that God has revealed to us, which he's revealed so much that everybody who has been revealed, we still have a lot to go with understanding who God is. Sorry about that. So, Again, when we understand the text and what's being communicated, then we have an understanding of what's being communicated to us, and then we base our theology off of it. 
So in verse 3, let none who hope in you be ashamed. Let none who hope have faith in Christ be ashamed. So he is talking about himself. He's, it's not just referring to himself, but this is a general plea to everybody who has hope in Christ, who hope, has hope in God. Let those who deal treacherously, the evil ones from before, I made the mistake, but now we understand based off the text that is being communicated to us, the evil ones that are my enemies, let those p evil people without cause, without cause be ashamed. So God, there are the weak people, there are the strong people. The strong that are against the weak, and that's a different thing. You can be strong in Christ, but there are weak people and there are strong people. There are people who specifically have faith in God. Those who do not have faith in God hit the enemies. Regardless of weakness and strength. I was going to go down a different path, but regardless of weakness and strength, those who have faith in Christ, those who do not have faith in Christ. Those who do have faith in Christ, let them not be ashamed. For those who do not have faith in Christ, let them be ashamed because they deal treacherously. It's not just they are not with you, they deal treacherously. But here's the thing, if you do not have God, how treacherously, how treacherously do you act? How treacherously do you act? Well, I don't act evil. Yeah, in comparison to another person, but according to God's rules and laws, you are still a required. You are still required to have faith in God because you continue to suppress the truth of God in your unrighteousness. So, and going back to who's going to be judged worse and more harshly, those who have more revelation, those who have been given the truth of God, Sodom and Gomorrah have been, have been destroyed but they will not be judged as harshly as those who have been given the faith. For the rest of eternity, they will not be judged as harshly. They still did evil. They still did what was wrong. They had the general revelation that God existed, and they just acted on their own merit. But those who understand, come to know Christ, and then turn away from the faith, you will be judged more harshly because... One plus one equals two. You then see it, you learn it, you understand it, you apply it, and then you say, nope, one plus one does not equal two anymore. I don't want it to be. That attitude is the reason God's going to judge you more harshly. Hey, here's the truth. Okay, well, what's the, what, what's the truth? You start to learn and explain, and explain to you and understand it, and then you say, wow, I don't like it anymore. I found it to be stupid. Um, one plus one equals two. Hey, you're stupid for saying one plus one equals two. Hey, you're stupid. It, that attitude of, of suppressing, here's the truth. That is why you're going to be judged. This is not just you who's listening, but that proverbial person. It's so those who, uh, those who suppress the truth of God will be judged, but those who have been given more truth and continue to suppress what is continued given to them. They will be judged more harshly. You do not cast your pearls to swine. Never understood that phrase until now. The pearls being the gospel. You don't continue to give the, a, a, a swine, somebody who is a dog or rabbit and vicious. You don't hang out with them. You don't feed that. You don't put your, give your hand to that person. You don't feed a beautiful thing to somebody who's just an animal. You don't. Because they are too animalistic. They're too primal in their nature that they don't care whether or not right is wrong, wrong is right. They don't care. Ultimately, it's what they think and want. Contradictions don't care to them. It's just personal experience. Which again leads me, this is something I need to explain, which, lead, which is leading me back to scripture as a need because my focus has been too often on the people who are against Christ that I need to be more delved into Christ rather than the people who are against Christ and why they're against Christ I need to actually get back into Christ I need to understand more about him I need to be more indelved in him I need that who is he why is he that's the important part and who who he has been for me and who he continues to be for me and then who I am in him uh, verse 4, make me, King David, know your God's ways, O Yahweh. 
teach me your paths. So, God, teach me. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For, which we just covered here. It's kind of interesting. For you are the God of my salvation. In you I hope all the day. Think, think about that for a second. That is a daily, th throughout the entire day, constant meditation and reflection. It may not be in the forefront of your mind, but in the deep recesses of your unconscious to always have the understanding, God's still there, God's still got it, I'm in him, he's got me. I'm safe and secure from the wrath of God that abides in anybody who sins against God. Christ Jesus has already paid that sacrifice for me. He is a substitute atonement for my sins. I am perfect in him because he was the one who perfectly saves me. He perfectly saved me. It's him. And to have that constantly in the back of your brain, in the back of your mind specifically. Again, a mind, mind is activity. Brain is the actual physical thing. And to understand, it's just... King David, who? What type of personality did King David have? He had a God is good, always in the back of his mind. Remember, O oh Yahweh, remember God, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from old. Now, initially, sounds a little weird, funky to me at least, but to know that what has been in the past. They well, actually, in America specifically, and in today's culture and generation, we have a hatred for the old because we want to build and then just create new. Build and then create new and try to destroy what's already been created. We have that as a cultural phenomenon that a thing, even Christians, even with Christians, if there's something old, it may be a bad thing. And there's that little creeping thing in the back of my mind, at least, that I grew up in the culture and I grew up around people that did not have that. The good thing is that we can learn and understand what is old is good. What came before us is a good and blessed thing. <laughs> a traditional wife? Yes, please. A one person, a one person how a one person income not a one person household a one person income that's awesome why well think of it this way why why would i say such a thing let's let's do it this way um i'm just gonna pull a number out of my butt 10 million people enter the job market we can't do 1 million but 10 million people enter the job market all of them men all of right age go into the market then, quote unquote, feminism, equal rights, quote unquote, women can now enter the marketplace. You now have 10 more million people who are available to work for cheaper than a man. What does that do with the average wage of the men at the home, in the home at the time? It drops it down. You do, on the extreme ends, get the best person qualified for that job. But also, now the extreme also happens. Those who were able to get a job are not able to get a job, and then they dwindle away. Okay, so here, here's the important part. Now, with 10 million, from 10 million people to 20 million people, on average, you can pay everybody less. The value of who is working, being able to fill that job, is less. The, and now you have to have, not just was before, but you have to have a two-person income. A two-parent income. Every, that's now a normal thing. You have to have two parents to be working. Welcome. Good job, feminism. <laughs> it's like... Oh my gosh. It's like God is the one that is good. This is showing what is old is good. This is a good thing. When God, again, specifically of what has been in the old, the thing, the specific thing that is old, that is old, not just the fact that it's old, but to know that things that are old can be good. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. That your compassion, your loving kindness, the things from the old, you God from the beginning, you God from the beginning. 
your compassion, your loving kindness that you started, the things that which you've continued to do beforehand to our forefathers, etc. That's a good thing. God, remember those things that you have done, please. It's a blessed thing. Do not remember the sins of my youth. King David does not want his sins remembered or my transgressions. According to your loving kindness, remember me, King David, for the sake of your God's goodness, O Yahweh. Blot out my sins. Good and upright is Yahweh. Therefore, he, God, instructs sinners in the way. Okay, so you could think of this as a few ways, but just to very simply, you are a sinner. Every single person before God was a sinner. And he instructs us either through the word or through general revelation. For example, if you kill millions of babies every year for 30 years, what happens to that society? When you allow homosexuality to be a thing publicly and it's, oh, it's not an evil and you have Christians who are in Christ to defend it, what do you think happens to that society? We're going through a period in which Satanism and quote-unquote liberalism leftism is the same thing. There are too many overlaps with Satanism and them defending everything that's on the left. Satanism is defending homosexuality. Satanism is defending transgenderism. Satanism is defending murder of the children. Satanism is trying to say Christianity is wrong. If you are a leftist, if you are somebody who's more liberal, guess what? Satanists agree with you. That's not a good place to be in. I'm sorry, you need to change. I, that's the thing, is that general revelation. You know, should, should we be killing this baby? Well, it's not a baby because we want to define it differently. Okay, well, can you define any other person any other way? No, you just, what, shouldn't? By whose standard? Whose authority? What consistent basis are you doing this? Or are you just doing like, because I've read I don't, that I want? That's retarded. That's dumb. That's stupid. But yet, what happens when dumb, stupid, and retarded becomes the norm? What happens to a society when the basis of thinking is, <clears throat> the society's not going to last well. The good thing is, is that America still has a hope and a prayer and a chance because God, Christ Jesus, is working through the, Mer the Americans right now. And I pray and I pray and I pray that um, God is glorified in the process that is happening right now in America. But I ask and pray that America is saved, not because go America, but because Christ to be glorified and be known through the, uh, through the Americans he makes. And it doesn't mean any ethnicity, those who are naturally born here. No. Those who are Americans, those who, who come here, want to be here, fight for being here, and want to first and foremost, Christ is good. Defending the nature of who God is, defending their faith, and preaching the gospel, and saying, yeah, we shouldn't be murdering babies. Yeah, homosexuality is wrong. Why? Because life is good. God made marriage between a man and a woman and anything else is an abomination. And if you disagree, well, then by whose authority do you stand, do you stand on consistently? And if you yourself stand on your own authority, by whose authority do you stand on that made you or gave you authority? If you yourself, well, then means that you have self-attesting authority. Who says you have self-attesting authority? It's like going through those rhymes and reasons. God is the basis and foundation of our ways. If he's not, we're dead. Which is quite literally, Christ is life, without him, death. That's what rebellion against God is. It's very scary to go against God. It really is. May he, God, lead the humble in justice. May he, God, teach the humble his way. Those who are not prognitious. I don't know what word I'm thinking of. Um, but I think I'm like combining two or three different words together. Prognitious. That's a, that's a weird word. Um, those who are humble. Those who do not boast within themselves. Those who seek out God. You're nothing. You're nothing without God. And those who claim themselves to be something because of themselves. There's that one example. Little Nas is a gay hater of God, 
and he's been pro Satan, pro hey go Satanism. He's cussed out profane Christ. He went to the quote unquote Met Gala, and I found this on YouTube. It's not something I looked up. I just found it on YouTube. He went to the Met Gala covered in silver. Well, that's pretty much like Satan. Look at how beautiful I am. Uh, who made you beautiful? I did. I'm amazing. Okay. When God, again, on the final day, and you hate, hate you hating God so much that you think that you are beautiful because you. That's what Satan, God made Satan beautiful. Satan then said, look how beautiful I am. I'm amazing. Go me. And pat himself on the back. It's like, what, are you not going to praise God? Are you not going to thank God? God is the one that gave you? It's Christ is the beautiful one because of who he is. What he is is intermingled, is inseparable for who he, from who he is. It's, and just to realize like the nature and culture that we live in, it's sad that people are trapped by their sin. Their, 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 their hatred for God to such a point and degree to not know the beauty that is Christ, that is Jesus, that is the word of God to make one a life, to have their sins be put to death. For all of eternity, bless, bliss and joy and harmony is found in God and he has you for all of eternity. There is nothing else worthy of fighting for. Everything else in which I do throughout the rest of the day is just a blessing I have been given to do. Because, um, again, I have to... My, it, it really is. I have, again, three jobs, I, but I have like four or five that I'm working on uh, during the summer I'm going to be doing because there's two things that I do. One, I'm going to be doing like an hour worth of exegesis and video creation. The other one is I'm going to be working on studying something else, uh, profession-related behind the behind the scenes so i'm gonna be busy i'm all these things in which i'm busy god i ask that you get glorified in all of it so let's just go ahead and get uh get this all the paths of yahweh are loving kindness and truth we've already seen that before to those who guard his covenant and his testimonies those who fight and protect god's word god's ways god's sayings god said love thy enemy what are we to do love just because we fight for the word are we actually acting upon the word that's an important aspect verse 11 for your namesake O yahweh pardon my iniquity for it is great great king david had iniquity he needed saving from or his sins his injustices that which he has enacted upon who is the man who fears yahweh I don't know if that's a general question or he's about to get into the answer. He, either God, because it's a capital H, but it's at the very beginning of the verse, very beginning of the sentence and the very beginning of the line, could be referring to man. So let's continue reading. We'll instruct him. So it's God instructing the one who fears God in the way he should choose. Which is really good. That should be a blessed thing for us all. When God... When you, when you are fearing God and you are curious and um, in your understandings of where you will be going in life, when you know that God is the one that directs you, he's the one that will instruct him, what should I do on a day-to-day -day basis? What should I do to week-to-week -week basis? What should I do for this one moment? God will instruct you. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, that's, yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, there's nothing else to really say there. <laughs> Verse 13, his soul will abide in goodness, either man's soul or God will abide in man who fears God, or it's man who fears God, being instructed by God, will abide in what is good and who is good is God. And his seed, man's seed, which again, this is referring to man, the first part of the verse, man's seed will inherit the land. Your children will inherit the land if you abide in God. It does not mean inherently 90, 100% of the time because God has a purpose and a plan for all things. So again, book of Job, death and destruction came upon him. His children were all dead. So wh where, where is his seed? Dead. But he was given m more children and the children that were killed were murdered 
God still has those children for Job. So, just as a reminder, God does keep his promises. By the means and the method, I may change, and we may never like it. <laughs> it's so... Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, verse 14. The secret of Yahweh is, are for, uh, is for those who fear him. We've already seen this above. So, repetition. It's an important thing to key in on. Fear God, and he will make them know his covenant. If you fear God, he will teach you. If you fear God, he will learn he will learn it you. <laughs> he will make you learn it. My eyes are continually toward God. So this is not a just I'm looking up. Oh, that's something else. Sorry. Uh, it's not that he's just continually looking up to heaven. It's the uh, the the metaphoric I am looking towards you. I am seeing your face. God, I see no face, but I'm looking towards your face. I want to look towards your presence. For he, God, will bring my, King David's, feet out of the net. The snare in which I have been in, God will save me. Oh. I'm going to do this. Oh. Oh, oh. I pushed some buttons and I messed up. There we go. Turn me to be gracious to, uh, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am alone and afflicted. He is alone. He's afraid. I don't know what else to say. He's, yeah, God, mercy me. Mercy me. I am afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Just this continuation. He is pleading. He is lamenting. He is coming to God in need for his salvation because King David's heart is distressed. Now he actually might physically be distressed, but this is an, this is I think all metaphorical language of what is being of what is happening inside King David's mind. See my affliction and my trouble, and forgive me of all my sins. He is continuously King David has already mentioned God. I have great iniquity. Please mercy me. He's how many times in this passage alone has he said God? Please forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. Please. See my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Resh. Okay. See my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me uh, with violent hatred. This, verse 19 is nothing but enemies. Here we go. Here's the last section. Keep my soul and deliver me. God, secure me. Do not let me be ashamed, for we've already mentioned a few times in this passage for those who will be ashamed versus those who won't be ashamed and God pleading for those who are fearing you. Do not ashame them. Hold them, keep them, save them. Those who hate you, let them be ashamed. Let, let them be fool, fooled, foolish. Let them be cast out. For I, again, do not let me be ashamed. For I, King David, take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness guard me. Let virtuous, let virtuous, virtuousness, let virtues encompass me. For I, God, oh no, no, I'm sorry. For I, King David, hope in you, God. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Here's the part of the verse in which I found very interesting, the whole part of this uh, passage. If we look at the very end, let Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. We constantly see Jerusalem be referred to as a woman, the bride of God, the bride of the, the bridegroom, whom is God, Christ. When the reference here, out of all his troubles... If we go back to understanding the pronouns that they referred to in every single one of these pa of these verses in this passage, Psalm 25, we see what has been referenced in in Genesis. I want to actually turn to it because I don't want to misquote, misrepresent it. Oh, good. Okay, turn close to it, not it, but close to it. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. What? No, I'm, uh, I'm looking in Genesis right now.
There we go. Okay, I was I got the right chapter and the right uh, the passage, but I, I was thinking the passage out of order. Okay, Genesis chapter 32. This is Jacob wrestling with God. At the very end, it says, uh, or in, in the middle of the passage, I'm sorry. When Jacob is wrestling with God and God is um, not having, Jacob is not letting go of God. God then says to Jacob, so he said to him, what is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And then God said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. That passage right there is important, right? Is important. Regardless of whatever the intention of King David was, what is being communicated consistently through scripture is that from verse uh, chapter 32, redeem Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. Israel, Jerusalem, is referred to as the bride, as a woman. And God specifically says multiple times that Jerusalem is a harlot and a whore. I have brought you out of from a baby. You as the whore have slept around and made covenants with all the evil people and have spit and spat in the face of me, your God. That's what multiple times Jerusalem has been referred to and Jerusalem was destroyed. With this passage... In chapter 32, Jacob, a God calls Jacob Israel. The one who believes and fears God, you are Israel. You are the redeemed. You in Christ are saved. Out of all of his troubles, his troubles. His tr that pronoun is so important and vital to understanding that section. Again, just going verse by verse, passage by passage. This is so interesting. So we need to understand more and more. Scripture is not just random, made by man. This is God working through men. This is God working through men. And to understand, painting the picture, it has nothing to do with your blood um, relativeness in God. It's God's blood cleansing you it's not your blood to god it's god's blood on you to you hit god christ's blood has been sacrificed has been spilt as a drink offering for your sanctification and your purification so you can be stand before the throne of god blameless because all of priesthood in the old testament was painting the picture of christ's sacrifice it's different because we as humans today do not have that reference we're kind of void of understanding that until we get into Scripture and understand what has happened in the past. Remember, Jesus Christ loves you, that he gave himself upon the cross, he broke his, his body has been broken, and he spilt his blood for you, his sheep, those who have faith and believe in Christ as their Savior, one and only Savior, from the abiding wrath that was on you, and deservingly, because you rebelled against God. Because Christ gave his life for you, and for every single day for the remainder of his eternal life, he intercedes for you. That is a love that is unquestionable. And all he asks is for you to turn away from your ways, turn towards him. Every day, Jesus loves you. And I love you because God loves us first.